My name is Dr. Arita Frommel. I am the Director Emeritus of the Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health, retired for several years, and I'm here to conduct an interview with Dr. Vivian Brown, an esteemed colleague and friend who has been a leader in mental health and substance abuse services in Los Angeles, California, the nation, and internationally. Neither of us are social workers, but we have great interest in the subject matter of the California Social Welfare Archives because our interest has really been social welfare. And I am delighted and honored to be able to interview Dr. Brown for the archives. Well, Dr. Brown, we're going to start with asking you to tell us a little bit about how you became such a leader in this field of substance abuse and mental health. Well, thank you for calling me a leader. Um, I really started my career, I think, uh, as I filled out my application for USC uh, for graduate school in psychology um, and put down that I was very interested in mental health and substance abuse and I wanted to do research around those areas. And when I came to the school, of course, I found out that there were no courses in substance abuse and no faculty that were really interested in substance abuse, but I had the fortunate experience of uh, interning at the VA hospital in Britain, and on the Wadsworth side, Dr. Sidney Cohen was doing incredible research on substance abuse, and including LSD at the time, talking about the 60s, early 60s, and he was someone who not only did this incredible research on LSD, but helped contribute to the knowledge um, for community people who were using LSD of what um, was, in fact, in the LSD, such as strict nine and that goes on, etc. And so that information getting out to the community was extremely important. So I had this wonderful experience of working with him. And on the other side, uh, at Brentwood, I was on the last locked ward um, at the VA hospital in Brentwood as the antipsychotic medications were distributed and people for the first time in the VA could really leave the VA and have a functioning life. So it was a very exciting time and it was exciting for me because I was seeing mental illness, serious mental illness on the and substance abuse combined. So there was my my interest and my dream living in the internship and the quality of other psychiatric service, which became Dean Kirsch Community Health Center. And what was really emerging for me was not only the interest, but looking at the silos. So there was mental health and then there was substance. There were children's services and there were adult services. And there was crisis intervention and there was long-term psychoanalytically oriented psychotherapy. And all of that just kept striking me as you have to break down the silos. So my career has really been around breaking down the silos and working with co-occurring disorders. Tell us more about though, how you came to want to be interested in substance abuse and mental health. As you said, it was very unusual. Nobody was doing that. What's led, and you were then talking about your application to USC for a doctorate in psychology. So you had some previous experience that led you to make that choice. Well, a few things. One, uh, I was very interested in, in psychoanalysis. Reading Freud at a young age and thinking I'm going to be a psychoanalyst. Um, so this, then, what also occurred to me was that I had an uncle who was a very young man and a heroin addict. The family didn't want to talk about it, but I happened to love this uncle. You know, I was very young, of course, so he died at 25 uh, of an overdose. He was put in the narcotic farm, which was the Lexington Hospital, affectionately known as the narcotic farm, where they did a number of research studies 
shouldn't have done under human subjects' uh, protocol. They were testing things like uh, LSD and other things before LSD on patients. And what years would that have been that he was in he, that, that would have been very early. That would have been probably in the 40s. And you say Lexington in Kentucky for California, so maybe watching the archives. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. We, there was no comparable facility in California. No. There no, it was really the, the, the big yeah. Yeah, drug treatment program in the country. And what was interesting was that when I met Sid Cohen, Dr. Cohen was uh, then going to be the director of NIDA. He, he left uh, on a sabbatical for a couple of years to be the head of the uh, National Institute of Drug Abuse. And one of the things he said was, I wanted to close Lexington, and they didn't let him. It eventually closed it, but um, it, so my, it's sort of like everything was intertwined at that point between family history, interest, and starting a career and interning at the VA. So it was very interesting that all of that came together. And it, they forgot to tell me that I could only worry about and I always say that we never told our patients they could only have one problem. And it just, it, it seems so odd to me that if a person who had substance abuse problems showed up at the mental health agency, the mental health agency said, you've got to go with substance abuse. And if they showed up in the other direction, the same thing happened. And no one was talking about trauma. And of course, I had just, you know, I interned at the VA where trauma was alive and well. Right but not there. identified. But not. <laughs> you, led, you led the way on doing that. And, and we'll, also, talk, we'll talk about that a little bit in, in a bit later because we need to get some of your earlier career yes. development on the record before we get to how trauma okay. came to be such a prominent part of your contribution. <laughs> but your unique uh, coming together of, of all those uh, background characteristics and your interest is, I think, symbolic of the fact that you not only were a groundbreaker then, you continue to be so, but, but how interesting that all of these things came together in you. How wonderful. <laughs> so tell us then, um, you talked about your internship. Uh, tell us about your career moving forward from the internship. Well, I, one of the places, of course, I interned was the Los Angeles Psychiatric Service, which became the Dean of Bush Community. And that was my first job. So I entered that system, and I was very excited because the, the funding, of course, under uh, Kennedy, President Kennedy, uh, for community mental health centers was coming to be. And D.D. Hirsch was, that community mental health center was born. And they allowed me uh, to keep developing programs, which I was very excited to do. So I developed the substance abuse treatment program. I developed a number of uh, specialized services for Venice community, a specialized uh, African American program, a specialized uh, Latino, Latina program, crisis center in uh, Venice, and kept going uh, so that what happened is I started writing grants for the community, and then I, as my staff said, you really are now a grant judge. I kept writing grants to develop bigger and better co-occurring programs. And so when I said we're going to be doing both mental health and substance abuse, everybody said, well, you can't do that. You know, there's you're not even going to get funding for it. But I found ways uh, to get some funding going in different directions. One was the substance abuse direction of all the mental health. And at the time, HIV AIDS epidemic, of course, that was another piece of the puzzle. And most of the community mental health centers were not moving fast enough for HIV AIDS. And trauma was already on my radar at that time, too, because I was working with uh, rape crisis centers and domestic violence shelters. And the DV shelters didn't want to take women who used substances or were mentally ill. And so they kept sending them away. 
And again, that was the piece that connected the trauma from both the rape crisis and the domestic violence. And that began my journey in the 70s for trauma. And you spoke about becoming a, a grant junkie. Perhaps it would be useful if you describe something about the funding history and uh, the, the, the politics uh, in which you were working in the 60s and how that evolved. Well, that was pretty exciting, too. I mean, we had Landon and Petrus, Short Doyle funding, the CMHC, the Community Mental Health Center. I think you're going to have to spell these out for archivist readers or oh, listeners true, true. who don't know what we're talking All about. All of this and won't in the future. <laughs> yeah, right. Hey, well, with the Community Mental Health Center Act, of course, this was extremely important because it really was national, federal funding across the country defining catchment areas, areas throughout the country of a certain population. D.D. Hirsch's population was 170,000 people, catchment area 89, and the charge was to provide all mental health and substance abuse services uh, to that catchment area. And that definitely caught my imagination and my boss's imagination. Jacobson, who was very much committed to community mental health. And so we saw this picture of this 170,000 people, our family. And when I began thinking about the first substance abuse program, because many, you had to have a substance abuse program for the community mental health center funding, but you could sort of contract with one outside. Well, I explained to Jerry uh, Jacobson at the time that we should have our own because then we would design it for co occurring diseases. And he was very uh, supportive. So once that started, I then went for funding through some of the substance abuse grants. And of course, National Federal. Federal, Federal. Yeah. National Institute of Drug Abuse had a sizable budget, and there was National Institute of Drug well, so, and I took away, so I went for funding through them, and I kept seeing the federal money as the experimental money. I wanted to try models that would fit best for people who had both mental health problems and substance abuse problems, and that would allow me to develop a new model, then do the research, so we could do the research. I was encouraged to do it, I did it, and then be able to refine the model and then go back and say, okay, now here's the new model, and then receive some funding for that until it really showed good outcomes to be able to go to the county uh, in Los Angeles County and, and say, these programs will really work. Uh, and that's sort of been the development, uh, again, throughout my career as, as I added things like the trauma or HIV AIDS to go to the federal government for the research funding or R&D funding, research and demonstration projects, to show that this could work and then how to do it better and then how to get that model disseminated across the country. And that's really how my career sort of kept developing because I kept adding the other pieces. And then looking at the population, once I looked at the population of people who had substance abuse problems and serious mental illness, then I realized all, or I was, I'd say about 90% of them had experienced trauma in childhood and in adulthood. And that became the next piece of the puzzle, so that and the trauma piece. Now, I thought, all of mental health would be very excited about it, adding trauma, but they weren't. That wasn't, that wasn't a priority issue for mental health at that time. Now we're talking 70s. It was not a priority issue, but the federal government did have special funding uh, for community mental health centers, particularly around their prevention and uh, looking at, at trauma and violence. And so we got some of the first funding uh, from the Rape Prevention Study Center in the federal government. And we then had 
the Southern California Rape Prevention Study Center at David Bush and began the work on, on the trial. And similar things with HIV AIDS. So that, again, the one in white funding was very available for HIV AIDS after. Again, this is federal funding. Federal funding. <laughs> Based on real advocates storming the federal government to say, you're not saving lives. People were dying in the streets, people were dying in the hospitals, people were dying, and some of us wanted to save them. So we began doing the um, HIV AIDS services as well. So we kept adding the pieces. By that time, we were talking about AIDS, for HIV AIDS. And I and my business partner, Mary Ann Frazier, felt that community mental health centers, a couple of problems. One is they weren't keeping up with the emerging community needs, which CMHCs were supposed to, but they weren't. And part of the reason they weren't is they became too, more, too involved in trying to raise funds because the community mental health center funding from the federal government de decreased based on the fantasy that poor communities could pick up their share. Um, eventually, county mental health, of course, picked up some funding for the community mental health centers, but they could never reach the amount of money that was supposed to be picked up. So the community mental health centers worrying about the funding were not going to take on new projects. Mary Ann Frazier and I decided to form a new program. So we founded Prototypes, Centers for Innovation in Health, Mental Health, and Social Services. In what year? 86, 1986. And uh, we were launched and... Um, okay. Can you encapsulate the mission statement for that at that time? Yeah. It was an agency designed to, one, meet emerging community needs. That was our mission, mission statement, emerging community needs to develop models to meet those needs, to test them and refine them with research, and disseminate the information to the country to increase the knowledge base. And everybody thought, wow, what a name. You know, <laughs> that was a long name and a long mission statement. And I, you know, it's very, it's a pleasure to say we did it. Uh, so we started with funding from LA County Substance Abuse, Alcohol and Drug Abuse. And uh, we wrote a proposal for drug residential treatment for women who are living with HIV AIDS or at risk for HIV AIDS who also had substance abuse and mental illness and their children. And we were funded Taking on all the problems of one. That's right. <laughs> we were funded for uh, 22 beds uh, for the women and the children and the extra beds. And then um, within the year, as we were developing the, the facility, finding the facility and starting up, uh, there came additional funding from uh, substances from the LA County uh, Alcohol and Drug Abuse uh, to pick up another 11 to 13 beds, which I graciously accepted. <laughs> so we, we really were launched, and I began um, with Mary and Frazier, the Prototypes Women's Center in Pomona. And we took over this facility that was a school, a Christian school, that uh, was no longer able to economically keep up the school. So we took over this facility, which was three and a half acres fabulous facility, and grew that. We then, with funding from uh, a number of places, began adding to the residential outpatient services, eventually mental health services uh, funding from LA County, uh, HIV AIDS services, both from the federal and the county, because the county, LA County had an AIDS office that was receiving because of California's uh, AIDS epidemic. And um, we also had some additional funding that came a little later for the Women with Co-Occurring Disorders and Violence Study, the SAMHSA funding, 
that study was extremely important for us and the country because it was SAMHSA wanted to know what are the best practices for women with mental illness, serious mental illness, substance abuse, and trauma. And then there was a subset study for their children. And for, there were nine sites to look at the women and, and work with them, and four sites to look at the children as well. And the prototypes was one of both uh, major study and the subset. I should probably clarify that I was involved with that project after I had retired as director of mental health because it would have been a conflict of interest for me to do that. Much as I endorsed all the experimental things you did over the years. <laughs> Correct. That's it. You were retired and we were thrilled that you would work with us and that was a wonderful experience. Well, it was a great project and you could talk more about it as, as it reflected all you had learned over the years before and how you used it to document and further promulgate the information about best practices. That study had so many incredible pieces to it because I think even SAMHSA, I think, was a bit surprised by the results. They didn't expect the results to be quite as good as they were. Um, what we were able to show is that if you integrated mental health, substance abuse, and trauma in all the interventions, so that if you, you know, were residential, we had residential programs, we had outpatient programs. But at every uh, point of contact with the client, with the woman and her child, you integrated all of that within the individual session or the group session. We implemented trauma-specific interventions, seeking safety, uh, trauma recovery and empowerment trend, and two that were designed specifically for the study, um, seeking safety and trend on evidence-based practices. So we showed that if you incorporate that, which was very easy to do because both mental health and substance abuse programs do group therapy. So the group intervention was very easily and quickly integrated. The trauma-informed piece, which I am still working on across the country in my consultation, the trauma-informed piece goes beyond the intervention. It goes to the system to the practice that we assume every client has experienced trauma. And if we assume that, then we change our practices so that we do not re-traumatize. And we understand how important it is that the trauma is a part of the practice. And that part has really penetrated the country. And I think a couple of studies did that. One was the ACE study. The Adverse Childhood Events Study, done by uh, and, uh, Dr. Sandy and Felitti out of uh, Kaiser Permanente San Diego and CDC out of Atlanta, Georgia. And the Women in Co Occurring Disorders and Violence Study, again, another major piece of the puzzle, because again, we could show the country most of the people, most of the clients that we were seeing, particularly women, but also men. Trauma experiences. In fact, that was the major other piece. Mental health, around 90%. Substance abuse, around 90% trauma. And the ACE study showed that the childhood adverse events that people experienced not only caused uh, mental health and substance abuse problems, but health problems. And so they were able, because of Kaiser Permanente's study, they had 1,700 people, they looked at them, asked them about their childhood adverse events, but they had now at around age 50 all of their health problems. And it was very clear that the higher the number of childhood adverse events from the higher the likelihood of serious health problems. And then they continued their studies, and of course they liked the serious mental illness, the illness studies that show seriously mentally ill people who have serious mental illness will die earlier. Same thing with these. People who have significant childhood adverse events will die earlier. And we're talking somewhere in the age 20 to 25 years. So very important studies. And we kept a 
disseminating information from our study, Women with Co-Occurring Disorders, and the ACE, because we found the ACE study fit right in with what we were doing. And so we, we wrote about 75 publications just from that study. And I think people were quite shocked. But they kept showing more and more pieces of what we needed to do to change our practice, including with the children. If children are seen with what we were able to show, if children are seen with the moms, both the moms and the children do that. And that was pretty significant. So rather than separating children, parents, to really bring the families together and do the family centered intervention, which again grew out of some of these studies. So it's been it's been a great journey, and I've now taken it to a whole other level, which is uh, I've been asked to consult with what is known as family drug treatment court systems, which are amazing, because they're real systems that work. <laughs> you have mental health sitting at the table, substance abuse, child, children's services, child welfare, the court, juvenile justice, um, education, parenting services, housing services, and it's for families who are involved in child welfare and children who are taken away or they're left while the parents go into treatment. And so they wanted to become more trauma informed because they had the pieces together, but they still weren't quite trauma informed. So I've been working with a number of these across the country, and it's been very exciting. You've talked about your role as a consultant. Would you review your role in terms of policy development and advice uh, over the years? So when you first started having a say in what's happening, perhaps you'll want to clarify the silos and the funding silos a little bit more as you, as you walk through this. Great, thank you. <laughs> Great question. Um, I really started pretty early in my career Doreen Loso from Region 9, National Institute of Mental Health, um, asked me two things. She wanted me on review committees, and she wanted me to be a site visitor for community mental health centers. So that, that began a whole other piece of the career, um, because sitting on review committees is exceedingly exciting, because you also have the chance to really start to, to shape um, questions. Let me just insert, that is a privilege which comes to very few, and it comes out of her role as a reviewer and seeing what you are doing at D.D. Hirsch Community Mental Health Center, right? So that's where it started, you putting into practice what you were getting and your, your beliefs and your values and your curiosity early on and leading to results. And so Doreen got you onto, uh, onto the, the first level of, of influence. Exactly, and the site visits were another place for the influence because here I was very excited that community mental health centers would break down the silos and then I'd go visit some of them and they weren't even doing what they were supposed to be doing. <coughs> Excuse me. So they weren't even putting into place um, things like drug prevention or substance abuse, etc. So that gave me another piece to work on. Then I was invited to do uh, some review of proposals for National Institute of Drug Abuse, National Institute of Mental Health, and um, the Rape Prevention Center in, in Washington, D.C. as well. So that kept bringing up questions that we hadn't received answers to, research questions, and really started um, helping me formulate as well as passing on information, and I was then invited to join a number of advisory councils for the federal government. So I served on SAMHSA's National Advisory Council, Substance Abuse <laughs> Mental Health Services Administration. Fund, they fund quite a few programs, including block grants to all the states in the United States. Um, I served on the National Advisory Council. I was co-chair with Charles Curry for a number of years, and I was a member for longer. I was a member of the 
SAMHSA Women's Advisory Committee. Um, I served on the state of California co-occurring Jane Action Committee, affectionately known as Co-Jack. Uh, which we started <coughs> again. That was about maybe 98. I don't remember the exact date. It took a long time for that to happen. A long time. A long time. During which you had been very active at the, at the federal level, yes. the national organization. Yes, in fact, uh, our committees helped write the um, federal um, monograph for co occurring disorders to the report to Congress on co occurring disorders. So we, we were somewhat happy with that report. It didn't go far enough. They took out a number of things that we had suggested. Again, more integration. Um, but that was really important. Um, I served on the Board of the National Mental Health Association. I served on the Los Angeles County Commission on Drugs and Alcohol. So in all of these, what was very exciting for me was to really be able to push the agendas for doing more and more on integration. So for me, of course, now the uh, integration of behavioral health and primary care is a natural. I mean, I, you know, I sort of said, yeah, what took you so long kind of thing. And I'm hoping, again, that it doesn't take as long as it took for substance abuse and mental health to put in place co-occurring disorders uh, programs because the bringing, integrating the systems is really uh, a major problem and then everyone begins to protect their turf and their funding and they don't want the funding to be blended and that slows everything down and of course we're going to see a new, I think a new era with primary care and so that's a logical lead into from the lessons you learned, what would you say to people who are trying to do this integration of mental health and, and primary health care? What what rules, what what approach should be taken? Well, I think we should have started a long time ago, but we haven't. <laughs> so we need to start quickly um, discussing the, the issues. And I believe trauma is the core issue. I think it, it takes away some of the stigma right, of what we've lived through with serious mental illness and what we've lived through with substance abuse problems. Because even a recent article, a journal article, showed that people really dislike substance abusers even more than they dislike serious people with serious mental illness. Um, well, trauma sort of takes away a little bit of the stigma for the outside people. And by that I mean, when I was uh, working with, particularly women with substance abuse problems, but also men, but I, you'll, you'll understand why I said particularly women. If I talk to people, even professionals, like myself, they would say, how can you work with those people? Those people, and I'm talking about mental health people, are saying this. And I'd say, who are you talking about? And you're saying, these women who use substances and then have children and they're destroying their children. And I began to share the fact that most of these women had early trauma way before they started. And that's what we started trying to even educate the federal uh, agencies and pushing that agenda because we, sh we could show the women with substance abuse problems had early childhood sexual assault, early childhood physical abuse, neglect, etc. And then started using the substance. Once people started to hear that, and it took a while for people to even hear that, their feelings about these women changed. Uh, and this, we saw similar things with women with HIV AIDS. If they told their doctors, 
I wanted to have a child. And part of that was because they thought, I'm going to be dead. I'd like a child to live after me. The doctor said, you can't be serious. You can't have a child. You have AIDS. So we've harmed people in many, many ways. Our own attitudes, uh, as well as the general public's attitudes, but our own attitudes. And of course, we've also harmed people by not recognizing trauma so that our seclusion and restraint, the whole issues around seclusion and restraint, when we didn't realize how many people had been already traumatized, we re traumatized them over and over again during the cycle. Again, unintentionally, we thought we were doing good, but we were doing harm. And so when we could, again, share that with people, to have them hear, you are dealing with populations who have been traumatized. And if you can accept that as the expectation, not the exception, you look at your practices and really understand what trauma is about. So that's the recommendation is that they accept and understand the role of trauma. How do you see that message getting across? Okay, so what, what now I am studying um, and, uh, is looking at programs, and of course I have my own prototypes program that I was able to do this with, but to other programs in other areas, uh, I'm researching in the health care, we have a program in pediatric cancer care that's trauma informed. In um, we have the emergency room that John Rich uh, in Philadelphia at uh, Drexel has included the ACE study questions and really working with young African American men who end up in the emergency room shock and working on trauma. Montefiore Hospital in New York has just integrated the ACE study questions for any woman who comes in who's pregnant. If she has more than four of the ACE questions scored, she goes into a special trap. That's the kind of thing I'm really talking about. That we know more about the models of how we can incorporate, and again, prototypes incorporate. We had a medical team right on campus at all times. You know, we built a low cost housing on the campus so people could live there and still get support. Those are the kinds of things that we have to really address. And, and we can't uh, spend too much time quibbling over who's funding it is. And you know who's in charge and who's doing what, and we have to sit together and say that this is what we know, this is what you know. Trauma links us. What have been the obstacles for you as you try to get that message across? I think funding has been brought up in almost every discussion. You know, it's, and for somebody, as you know, somebody who always got around some way the funding by getting this funding for this piece and this funding for that piece. You know, I, I didn't let funding stop me. But often people are saying, well, we don't have, we can't get funding for that. Um, we heard that with co-occurring disorders. Well, we can't get funding for that. You can't put down, you know, you can't mark substance abuse and mental health on the second, you know, line and get funding. So that's one piece we know. We also know that there are a large number of caregivers who have experienced trauma themselves. And they, on one hand, are fabulous um, caretakers and interveners because they are very sensitive to the issue. But on the other hand, some of them may not even realize that they have been traumatized. They haven't worked on that. And then they tend to take on more and more because they want to help everybody, and they're not realizing that they are now re-traumatizing themselves. So we have to be very aware of that, and we have to make sure that as we're training, we train everyone around trauma issues. What does it mean? What do you do? How do you do it? What does it look like? But also to make sure that people have the option to say, Wait a minute, I, I 
think some of the pediatric people are already really looking at it because they have to deal with the early childhood trauma. They're seeing, and, and I think they're starting to tune in. But again, one of the things you hear a barrier is we don't have the time. Every, again, this even more so in, in I think, health, in pediatric health and adult health care. You know, we have 15 minutes, we want to, you know, boom, 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 we have to, we have to diagnose, we have to do our notes, and we have to get on with it. And trauma informed says you can't do that in 15 minutes. You have to really have a practice and allows people to tell you what happened to them. And since they've been traumatized, they don't trust us. So you can't expect someone in the first 15 minutes of contact to tell you anything. They're going to deny, just like they're going to say. So all of those barriers have to be reduced. And again, what's your recommendations on how to reduce those barriers? Well, it, it, I'm glad you're saying that because um, one of the things I'm doing with these systems is trying to reduce the barriers. Um, I've developed a trauma-informed assessment for systems, um, and it was published. And it published in a substance abuse journal because the mental health people weren't quite there yet. But substance abuse was around the trauma issue. And um, using that assessment, it's a walkthrough. So it's not an audit. It's not going in and saying, you know, you're doing bad things and you've got to correct it. But it's walking through systems. And you can imagine with the family of drug court systems, it's like this huge system I'm walking through with a team. That they have to give me staff members, managers, and peers. Seniors who walk through with me. And we're all looking, you know, through different eyes because we have different experiences. And what could be at any moment, what process, what thing that we're doing, even the environment, could re traumatize this person? And then we all form this action plan and allow the team, without me, to pick it up and make the changes. And some of them can be very simple, like writing outside a, a, a mental health agency at night, you know, where somebody is terrified to come in. We, you know, one of the simple things I just mentioned, the um, one of the places in child welfare, they were taking these children for visitation through these long halls and gates and sort of dreary and not very appealing for a child who might have been traumatized. And I said, you know, to make, to make it simple and right, I said, you know, I happen to be short, so I have a different viewpoint than some of you tall people, but I think it might be good if you could paint some wonderful, child-friendly things along this wall so that the children are not scared as they're walking through this. And it was like, oh, that's simple. Simple things as well as some more complicated things. Like what kind of screening instruments? We're really advocating that everybody screen for trauma. It can be very simple. So you had lots of successes. You had lots of frustration. Oh, yeah. How do you deal with the frustration? Well, I don't know. It must be my New York upbringing. But um, when I'm when I'm frustrated and people try to stop me and my agency at the then I just say, okay, I'll find another way. And I think it's kept me um, going and feeling like I can do, still do something. Because you know, many, many times, you know, there's been somebody who wants to stop that process for many reasons. Um, and I would just find another way to do it. And it's it, when, when people, um, I was co-chairing the LA County Criminal Code Committee, and, People kept saying, well, we can't do that with the funding. And I said, yeah, we can. You can find a different way to get the funding and try it. Have you given up on, on uh, ending the silo funding? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we may have another chance now because of ACA and, and really looking at what I am worried about is that we know the residential treatment programs. And I was going to say drug treatment because they really are sort of classic. My residential drug treatment program for people
people with mental illness and trauma and it was 18 months later. So that we could take pregnant women and keep them beyond the pregnancy and the birth and still have them working on their issues. Now what's going to happen, I think, is everyone's going to cut residential. One, we have the problem about Medicaid funding for anything over 16 beds. That's point one that has, that really needs to go. Because you have some fabulous residential programs that should be funded at the more than 16 beds. Because just the economy of scale. She was quite wonderful, and one of the things she said to me, which I quote to child welfare all the time, and they look at me, she said, you people in your country think that the way to help uh, child abuse or child neglect is to take the parents and the children and separate them. That's wrong. And, I, you know, it really, it was indelible now, because she's right. I mean, separating, now, in certain circumstances, you some parents and some children. But if you have parents and children in treatment and you have an opportunity long enough to work with them and see what they're doing and helping them change what they're doing and learn how to take care of themselves as well as their children, you will see you know, better outcomes. So that, that's why I think it's exciting that the How would you describe the changes in the political and academic uh, knowledge base climate in which you've done your work over these 50 years? Well, it, it's definitely changed. I'm not sure that um, mental health, psychology, social work, etc. have all integrated the co-occurring disorder courses, you know, the kind I'm talking about. I think I would suggest, and USC, by the way, social work participated with us. We, we in our Women with Co-occurring Disorders and Violence that we had USC social work, psychology, and the educational group in black and women and that social social work. They were our evaluators. And so they, you know, people like Dr. Laura DeGatz and some of the uh, faculty in social work were part of that study. And it seems to me that they are the leaders to push the agenda that they're talking about, the, the co-occurring disorders. And there should be more force with them. We should, no one should come into uh, universities for psychology or social or psychiatric nursing or any of the helping professions and not learn really from them enough. And I think we need to do a little more work on that. But they have moved. Substance use with a woman, but they 
need to be integration with all of them. I think all of us have to be doing that training and studying, including in medicine. One of the areas where you also provide a leadership was in the role of consumers. Would you like to talk about that? I would love to. Again, you know, my career, because I worked so closely in substance abuse treatment, always included consumers. And so I was surprised that mental health did not include consumers early on in the in the 60s. So it was easy for me to have the concept that consumers are so important to helping um, the practice. Because in substance abuse, of course, recovery can be really easy to part of the stuff. So I kept pushing that. Um, so when we had the women with co-occurring disorders and violence study, we included, uh, as part of the mandate, every site had to have minimum of one consumer survivor recovery person, which was a new concept. Right? The person had to have a diagnosis of a severe mental illness, diagnosis substance abuse, and also had experienced trauma. And so they named themselves consumer survivor recovery, and we started to say CSRs, and then at the end of the project, everybody said it's too difficult to keep saying. So the consumer said, let's say women or men with lived experience. But we, but throughout the study, it was consumer survival recovery until people really understood we were talking about an incredible group of consumers. And they participated in every level of the study, including designing instruments, which the researchers had not done before doing implementation of the program, they and one of the I think one of the best parts when we did a the child substance, we designed a child intervention, trauma informed child intervention. The consumers wrote a letter to all the moms in the study, explaining why we were doing the intervention. Shouldn't be worried about it. This is what it's about. This is why we're doing it. And saying that if you have any questions, you can come to the Consumer Survival Recovery Center. Not one woman refused having her children consumed. And I believe it was because of the Consumer Survival Recovery They did everything with us. And we also had an entire training program that went through the five years for the Consumer Survival Recovery Center. So they learned everything about research, everything about whatever was a piece of the puzzle. And most of us uh, have hired all of us to survive for good. Uh, as you know, the prototype Paula uh, was just a, a gem, and she has been working in the uh, mental health programs since the project ended, since the study ended. So if you had to do it over again, anything you would do differently? No. <laughs> I would do it probably all the same way, but I, I learned a lesson, which is you can't push the time. That, that I learned from, you know, trying co-occurring disorders in the 60s couldn't be done to them. I mean, I could do it in my program, but you know, most people weren't, weren't going to do it. And it took this long, and trauma, keeps coming back, and so I think we may be able to push the trauma generation faster, only because every time we have war, and we lose something, it comes to the forefront of war. And so it's here with us on a number of levels, uh, sexual assault, child abuse, domestic violence, and war. And we can't let it go away again. You said quite a few things about how you think the field of service delivery, including the service delivery by social workers, needs to change, to move ahead. Are there other things you want to add to that? You just want to recap your recommendations for improving the field? Of well, I think, welfare? you know, now that there's enough, um, there are enough people, as I said, the USC is in a great position because there are enough people psychology and social work um, that worked on, on these projects that they 
they, I hope, called together this group of people who worked on these projects and really looked at where they want to go. And I'm not sure they've done that yet, but I think they need to because there are, again, these, this team that worked with us on, on our study, and I think it, it happened in a number of states, that the universities, you know, put together teams that really cut across some of the disciplines. That now's the time, bring those teams together and say, where do we go? Because they're the people who, who lived it as well. And then a few people who are out in practice as well. If, if some of the university people are not practicing as well. But to have the university people who've known some of this, the practice people who've done it and lived it, and the consumer survivor recovery people sitting in the same room really saying, where, where's the next, how do we take it to the next level? Particularly now in the community. And again, those people who work in each other's ways are very significant for that because we had to work with them. We were docs. There was no way. And they had to work with us. So what we did is we moved our team into the health centers, into the hospitals that were doing AIDS, into the healthcare system, etc. And we just moved in. I would think that from the Los Angeles County perspective, you have been, as we've said before during this interview, you, you've said and done so much to move the field to be a better delivery system, a better community, uh, and I think you must be very proud of the prototypes. You haven't said a lot about it directly, but that you founded it, you used it to carry out that wonderful mission in terms not only delivering service, but getting to know more and more to improve the field and the practice and, and to make this whole world of mental health, substance abuse, trauma, uh, health problems much more effective in taking care of the needs of the people. So uh, I think Los Angeles County in particular owes you a great debt of gratitude. <laughs> but I think uh, what you're doing nationally is showing that this is field to which you have made great contributions, and I think it's amazing that so many years after you formally retired from prototype, you continue to be having this good effect on the field, and I uh, look forward to your continued consultations around the country. Thank you. Thank you. I want to say that I really, uh, I'm, I'm, I feel fortunate that I was in Los Angeles County. Um, many reasons. Los Angeles County is so large and so important if they do something here that it really has some impact because you can tell you know, the country, this is bigger than some states. Right? The directors of LA County Mental Health, yourself, uh, Marv Southern, Dr. Southern right now, um, substance abuse, Dr. Ernest Strands, people who really care about moving the field. And so you allow people like me to obtain funding to try things out. You know, the county system can't just go around being experimental. Um, I could go out and get federal funding and state funding and county funding to do some of the experimental work. And I always felt that Accounting systems were supportive, and they always included me into in, you know, committees where I could say this. Uh, they might not be able to, you know, suddenly take the funding and blend it the way I might have wanted, but always very supportive. And I think that again, the county systems, the universities, and those community-based organizations that really understand some of these issues need to sit down and. and Take it to the next level. We have another chance with ACA to really do a great job. And I really think that the, the trauma piece, pulling us all together, makes a lot of sense. And makes some sense to push the field forward. USC has an entrepreneurial program, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And clearly, you are the ultimate example of entrepreneurial approach 
being used effectively. I think I do. <laughs> they should have you in the lecture at the entrepreneurial program. <laughs> the way around. How, how, to, yeah, how, to be, how to do that. Well, thank you, Dr. Brown, for this, I think, a very interesting interview. And I hope people learn, and I hope maybe there will be attached to it some of the references, because you have so much work that has been published and, and research findings that need to be incorporated.